This is Twit. All right, Jason, it's time to talk about Google I.O. All right. I'm happy to do it too. Cause this was a, this is a whirlwind 24 hours. I have to say, um, you know, Tuesday we had our regular episode of all about Android twit.tv slash AAA. And you want to check it out because it was me, my host, uh, co-host Ron Richards, Wintwit Dow and Michelle Ramon all in studio. They all made the drive up to Petaluma. And, uh, so we did an awesome, ep- you know, episode from the studio together, which rarely, I mean, we it's, there's never been Win in the studio or Michelle and all four, you know, and Ron rare, you know, rarely comes to the Bay Area anymore. Um, maybe he'll come more now that he's being invited, uh, to Google IO again. But anyways, it was a heck of a lot of fun. It was Ron's birthday. So we celebrated that as well as Florence Ion's birthday. But anyways, that was just the beginning. And then the next day, you know, so that evening drove down to, uh, Mountain View, checked in the host woke up very early the next morning and, and made my way to uh, Shoreline for the event. Now, Google I.O. in years past prior to COVID was a multi-day event. It, you know, you, I would go down there Tuesday evening and I'd come back like Friday night. Like it was just like three days. It was a long time to be there, but it was a lot of fun, but it was also, you know, could be very tiring and everything. And then of course, as with everything COVID happened, it uh, forced companies to, uh, to figure something out. And so of course, Google IO ended up being an online thing, online only. And now this is the second year where they've opened it up to a single day event. And uh, I just have to say from the, the from my experience, many years going to a multi-day event and then now going to a single day event, I kind of like it. Like it's actually really nice because it really kind of kept things focused. You still got the benefit of the experience being there going, oh, hey, I haven't seen you in a really long time. You got that social element, um, got a little bit of that excitement, but then what it gives Google the ability to do. And I actually talked to a couple of Googlers while I was down there, um, who are planning these IOs. And they basically said like, you know, we always saw IO as this, like, you got to be here to get the full effect sort of thing. But then IO forced us to kind of re imagine it as here's everything online for everyone, completely accessible. And they just said our engagement with all of this has got, has skyrocketed as a result. And they're like, at the end of the day, we want everybody to know what we know and what we want to communicate. So this seems like the most effective way. So that tells me this is likely, I don't have any certainty on this, but this is likely the way it's going to be with Google IO going forward. But I know that everybody at the, you know, the studio, Leo and, and Jeff Jarvis did some live coverage of the event. We had the keynote as we talked about earlier with Barry Schwartz, artificial intelligence probably spoken a thousand times. I was joking, uh, with Ron that, you know, we should get a transcript of the keynote, run it through Google Bard and ask Bard to tell us how many times was the phrase, was the term AI used and, and see, mm-hmm. you know, what, what number it gives us. But, um, you know, it, uh, like I said earlier, it really seemed like the big, big story here was yes, artificial intelligence, which we all kind of expected to be the case, but not just that, but artificial intelligence as it integrates into the products and services that you're already using. And I think that's the potential power that Google has, right? Where so many of us use and rely on Google services, their products, Gmail, it had one, um, uh, what was it called? Right for me, or I, I can't remember. It was, it was something along those lines where essentially you kind of type in a little short brief thing like, I want to write an email to so and so about this, blah, blah, blah. I want to be sure to mention the blah, 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 blah. And then it, you know, it will generate your email for you. And if it's too short, if it's too brief, you can have it expand and it'll broaden it out and add more detail and everything. It's just like, um, I'm, I hate to say it, but I'm probably going to use that for at least some of correspondence. Cause why the heck not, you know, check it out and try it. I don't know. You know, some of the integrations with, with Google sheets and being able to very easily, you know, tell it, you know, create a, I want a spreadsheet that, that itemizes, you know, all the, the many dog, sitter options in the area and the ones that are able of taking two or more dogs and uh, love chihuahuas and, and and create a spreadsheet out of it and with pricing and sort it. And, you know, you tell it these things and boop, you end up with it without having to do the hard work. I don't know. I find that compelling. I think a yeah, lot of people absolutely. are in front of it though. What do you think, Micah? So I find that part compelling. Um, the only 
Well, I can't say this for sure because I didn't watch every minute of it. But the the one thing that stood out to me that had me not happy or excited was talking about AI and its inclusion in text messages. Um, I don't like the idea of having of two people just having false conversations, basically letting yeah. AI just have a conversation with another AI instead of you both getting to just talk to each other. That really oh, yeah. was kind of uh, a, a problem for me. And then I, I've uh, talked about this in the past. The same thing I feel applies to instances where in many cases, not in every case, but in many cases where they showed like a manager uh, formatting an email saying, write up a congratulations to my team. Yeah. How you authentic not, is that? In your heart. Wow. Yeah. You, if you yeah. can't build that in your heart, then don't congratulate your team. Yeah. But that just feels inauthentic. And so the chance for, I don't care. It doesn't have to be Google's AI. It could be any AI. The chance for AI to sort of cheapen um, communication with others, I'm not fond of that idea. And yeah. But at the same time, what I am fond of is what Google, we're seeing Google do here, which is get AI, and by AI, I mean generative AI, closer to our operating systems, having it built into Android or built into uh, Workspace OS, essentially, um, is what I want to see from artificial intelligence because, from generative artificial intelligence, because there's a lot of heavy lifting that I do right now to get the uh, generative AI I'm using to do things that I'm asking it to do. So I have to do a lot of explaining and context and that kind of thing to actually right. get the response I'm looking for. But if it already has that context by being built in closer to the system, that's going to be, I think, very helpful. So yeah, yeah, I think there there are many ways this can be taken, and it seems like they're doing a lot of spaghetti projects. They're trying a bunch of different stuff to see, and that's fine to see what people use. I just really hate the idea of instead of me texting someone happy birthday, um, I have my you know my AI system uh, oh, for the rest of the year send out all my happy birthday messages. That's sad. Yeah. I mean, it's really what what you're talking about is there is the lessening of the hum, human element of the ways we communicate. And um, and I think that's a that's a big, big picture criticism of AI in general is wait a minute. It's it's removing the elements it has a potential of room removing the elements of life of our everyday life that are based around our humanity and putting it in the hands of the robot or the computer or whatever you want to want to call it and uh what you know what does that do to us just as humans like on on this planet with other humans i mean it it lessens it cheapens it has a potential to cheapen that experience and make things a whole lot less authentic as a result yeah so. and then i'm looking at messages and being suspicious of them did this person yeah, right, actually say this right. to me or was it generated by a machine? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I will also say, though, like I, I even in my text messages now, and we've had this for a few years. If my wife sends me a message like, hey, can you can you be sure to pick up some milk on the way home? It gives me that little prompt to say yes. And I do tap yeah. it as opposed to yeah. just typing. Yes. You know what I mean? So there are ways in which we are OK with it. Yeah, but, I don't think that's helpful. This is right? like generating a whole thread versus like a a couple of words, you know. So where are the differences? I think we're figuring that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's that's one thread, of course, of uh, of Google I/O. I, while I was there, I did get a chance to um, to play around a little bit with the Pixel Fold, which is Google's uh, new foldable device. So I got, you know, spent probably like five minutes with that in the press area and very nicely built device. Uh, feels really nice. You know, it is a gen one product, no matter how you slice it, it just is. Um, I didn't see anything other than th this is a little weird when you flatten it like the way you're seeing right now. And I didn't get a picture of it. It doesn't it's not completely flat. It's not 100% flat. Oh, it's got a really? tiny little bit of a bend in the, uh, in the hinge. Not quite like that. That was, that was done for artistic purposes, but, um, but yes, so it's even like a if you V, it but just a, it's a very obtuse angle. 
right? I mean, no way. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, and it's yeah, hardly yeah, yeah, perceptible. But if you lay it on the table, you see that it's not laying flat completely. It's just slightly domed. Interesting. So that's a little weird because I don't feel like the other foldables do that. And it's like, okay, well, you know, I had heard all of this pre, uh, pre-release pre news and rumors about how great the hinge system is, but why not that? Like you want this to be a tablet experiment experience when it's open. Most tablets don't have a slight kind of curvature to it that's you know down the middle. So anyways, maybe that's nitpicking, but that does feel very first gen. And for an $1,800 device, uh, like, uh, would I spend $1,800 on a phone? I don't think I would. Would you? I mean, we're in a weird oh, no. bubble. You get devices. No. Because of work, but I would not spend right, it. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, I, that I, I don't believe in in foldable phones. And by by that, I mean I know they exist. I believe in their existence. I don't believe in the need for uh, foldable phones. I don't think that they are. And I will happily eat my hat. Uh, you know, ten years from now, if foldables are what we're using, but I just don't find it compelling as a technology and i don't see a whole lot of people um everyday people finding it compelling as a technology which i understand part of that is the price that that definitely makes a, a difference yeah. but i remember so 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 many people getting the first iphone and that was very expensive at the time but people mm -hmm. still in swarms got the first iphone so to consider this sort of like the next evolution in smartphones. I don't think it's caught on that way. You don't see people scrambling to get it. And in fact, I see so many people who do choose to be early adopters as quick as they can returning these things, realizing they don't need them or want them. Mm -hmm. Trying to figure out like why, I mean, I, you know, in the times that I've had for review, any of these foldables. Yeah. Uh, I am like, I am trying hard to find the situations where I want to open it up, you know, and, and th those moments do happen, but, th but do they happen enough that I'm willing to spend $1,800 on it? I personally, not, th not true for me, but I am curious to get my hands on the pixel fold. I hope that I can get one for review here very soon. Also the pixel tablet, they had that there that I felt like was actually a pretty positive announcement. $500. I feel like is fair considering you get, that dock if the dock was extra if it, that that snapping like magnetic speaker dock was another 150 dollars, i'd be really hesitant on it um but i think as a total package for 500 dollars, and then the build quality was really nice um it, you know and turning it when you snap it on it's really satisfying when it snaps onto the base it's like got this little magnetic pull that just like there's no uh, misaligning it with the pogo pins on the back. It knows exactly where to go. It's just, it's a cool product. I, do I think the pixel tablet is going to reinvigorate the Android tablet ecosystem? I don't necessarily know that I, that I trust that that's exactly what's going to happen, but I understand why Google wants to do this. You know, Google really wants to create devices that demonstrate the stuff that they're doing with the software and the OS. And so this gives them kind of a, their own playing field to do that and to be the, the signal, the beacon for other hardware manufacturers, uh, to do similar things. So I'm, I'm very curious about the pixel tablet and getting my hands on that, I but think I think it's so cool. Did you like that or because I, I mean, it was I, amazing. I, think tablet, I think of iPad, I just think that, you know what? iPad won the game and you yeah, know, I, you're not wrong in that. But when I think of, um, when I think of smart home speaker, I think of either or, uh, Amazon or Google. I think they both have a good, in fact, let me see. I'm always moving my shoulder the wrong way. That is a nest hub right behind me. Oh, okay. And yeah. It's a great uh, digital picture frame. And this idea of like, I wish that I could just grab that and take it off and do things with yeah, it and right. put it back when that is just, it's a very smart idea. I think that um, even though, yeah, I, I'm not obviously a regular Android user and uh, don't have any interest in like making that switch. I do think that the idea is very sound and their execution is really spot on. I think they did a great job with the execution. So I'm yeah. really impressed with it, even if it doesn't become, you know, if it doesn't reinvigorate the tablet market or anything like that, it's just 
I think for people who like Nest Hubs, um, then they kind of get that benefit of, oh, and at any time I could take this and then, you know, show somebody that video that I thought was funny that I was talking right. about. Or, yeah, I just think it's very smart. Yeah. Yeah. So looking forward to that. I think the highlight of my time, though, was something that I did not expect to be there, but I actually had on my short, short list of, I, you know, if they have these things here, I would love for this to be there. And that was Project Starline. Starline, if you remember a couple of years ago, was announced and this is the booth. Uh, back then, a couple of years ago, it was like a whole booth system where they demonstrated it. it's essentially it's it's video conferencing where you really feel when you're looking in the screen like it's it's large enough and the way it's presented and, you know, it's all done in three dimensional um, a view you really feel like that person is right there and you know, it's full eye contact and everything. And I got five minutes in there with one of the co-founders, uh, the co-creators of this technology. And it was like, it gives me goosebumps talking about it because it like, do I think that we're going to see these things everywhere? Not necessarily, but two years ago, it was huge technology that was incredibly expensive. And now what they were kind of showing off is that, you know, two years of development, they've created a single screen with cameras that kind of flank the screen. And it's just become a lot more doable, a lot more uh, miniaturized. And the effect was really impressive. The screen was very large. Um, it looked like, you know, I was sitting there talking to the co-founder. I wish I could remember his name. I should have written that down before this, this show, but um, talking to him through it. At one point, he holds up an apple and he's like, so what does this what does this you know look like to you? And I swear I could have reached out and grabbed that apple. And oh. instead he put out his fist and he was like, give me a fist bump. And I did. And I was and my brain was like <laughs> weirded out about the fact that I wasn't feeling a fist when I did that. Like it looked that like the dimensionality of it was really crazy. And uh so the is it a hologram? No, it's just like a 3D, it's it's just what it is, is a giant screen. I mean, it's you uh -huh. know a giant screen that's having some sort of parallax 3D view technology. You have to be right in the right sweet spot in order to get the effect. The other thing that I thought was interesting, another detail is, yes, it's a screen, but the bottom third of the screen, there's this like this like border that kind of curves out towards you. And from uh -huh. my position, what it meant is I didn't see the bottom of the screen. I saw this like curved border that seemed to be a border that um, that the 3D image resided inside of. So instead of me looking at this and going, oh, this is a screen that's 3D, it just kind of seemed like I was looking through a window because it kind of cut Got off that it. bottom of the screen. And it was a really cool illusion. Like if that wasn't there, I'm sure it would have been neat too. But because it was there, it made it less like I'm looking at a screen. I will say it was very strange because um, it forces like it basically when you're looking straight ahead, the, there is no camera that's looking right at you. And so the fact that you are making eye contact with the other person that's generated, that's generated because of these different cameras at different angles, processing the eyeball forward and doing that, like having that experience with a screen where we were just like connecting eyes and everything like that was on one hand really cool. But on another hand, I wanted to look away. I was like kind of uncomfortable by it. It was like, <laughs> and I, I can look at, I can, I can do eye contact, you know, in conversation. I have no problems with that, but there it was just different to have eye contact with a screen. It was just really strange, but, but very cool. I was super floored actually by that demonstration and so happy they had it there so that I could check it out. Wow. That's what I wanted to hear about the most. So it is cool to hear about it. For yeah. Sure. Just that Super experience. Neat. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> and I, and I felt lucky because they were booked up and they, they were able to kind of fit me in and I wasn't thinking that it was going to happen, but they did. So thank you to the Starline team. Uh, do not uh, miss, we did an interview, a sit down interview with Dave Burke, VP of engineering at Google and Samir Samat, VP of product management. Um, that was me, Ron and Wynn the all about Android team talking with them about a lot of the Android related announcements. Yes. Some of the artificial intelligence stuff, the devices and everything twit.tv slash news three nine one. If you want to check out that interview and uh, yeah, that was my time at Google IO. This episode of tech break is brought to you by ACI learning certificates, open doors to entry level it positions and promotions for those already in the field. CompTIA courses with IT Pro from ACI Learning 
Make it easy to go from daydreaming about that career in IT to launching it. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit to learn how you can elevate your skills. 